Okay, here we have 8.1, the inverse sine, cosine, and tangent functions. So now that we've talked about the trig functions, now we're going to start talking about the inverse trig functions. Um, so just from college algebra, you remember that um, an inverse for a function will only exist if that function is one-to-one. -one. So um, that means for one-to-one -one functions, you have these properties. So um, the function itself, if you take the inverse of the function itself, these two basically undo each other. And so you just end up with whatever the input was to the, from the beginning, okay? And that happens for every x value that's in the domain of f. You can also conversely do it the other way around. So you can take the f of the inverse. Again, these will undo each other, giving you just the input that you had in there to begin with. Um, now, here's some other important properties because when we're finding domains of functions, that's relatively easy to find. It's the range that might be a little bit more difficult to find in certain situations. Um, it's much easier to find a domain than it is to find a range. So this property comes in handy a lot because they're telling us that the domain of f is the same as the range of f inverse. So if I'm trying to find the range of f inverse, all I need to know is how to find the domain of f. So it makes finding the range easier because we know how to find domain. And similarly, the range of f is equal to the domain of f inverse. So if I can find the domain of f inverse, then I automatically know the range of f, which will really, really come in handy. So it says the graph of a one-to-one -one function f and the graph of its inverse f inverse are symmetric with respect to the line y equals x. So that's just the sample property still from college algebra. And then if y equals f of x has an inverse, the equation of the inverse function is x equals f of y. The solution to this equation, meaning if you try to isolate the y, you get y equal to f inverse of x. That is going to come in handy because that is essentially how they're going to define the trig functions, okay? So the first thing it tells us here for exploration um, one is it tells us, let me get all the way there. There we go. It says, based on the information of a one-to-one -one function, the graph of the sine function below is not one-to-one. -one and does not have an inverse function on its entire domain, negative infinity to infinity. Why is this? It's because it fails the horizontal line test. That's how we test graphs or images to see whether or not they're one-to-one. -one. We imagine a bunch of horizontal lines, and if there exists just one horizontal line, imagine that's actually horizontal, shouldn't have gone down, should have just been straight across. I can't draw lines apparently. But you get the idea. This line would have hit the graph an infinite number of times. If this was continue going up, it would hit it here. And as it keeps doing this, it would have hit it multiple times. It hits it here, it hits it here, it hits it here. And then again, if this goes down, it's going to hit over here somewhere and so forth as it keeps doing this periodic behavior, right? So any horizontal line that I draw is going to touch that graph at more than one point which means that a sine function in its entirety is not a one-to-one -one function. However, neither is a, um, oh, what is it called? A cubic function or squared function, right? This guy here is not one-to-one -one, because if I draw a line right there, but if you remember in, in algebra, we restricted the domain and said, let's only look at x values when x is greater than zero. So from here, this way, and now it is one to one, right? No matter how many horizontal lines you draw, they only touch the graph once. So we restricted the domain on an x squared function. You can do the same sort of thing with the trig functions. You just restrict their domains and then you'll have a one to one function. Now, normally you wanna get one whole period so you could take 
from negative pi over two to pi, you get this whole entire period. Um, and it's not even a, uh, it's not a whole period because the whole period would be over here, right? It's actually only half of a period because the whole period would not pass the horizontal line test. But if you took it from here to here, um, it would pass the horizontal line test. Now, what happens if we were to try to go from zero to pi? That's half of a period, but notice it doesn't pass the horizontal line test. So more significantly, we need a section of this that will pass the horizontal line test. And this section right here from negative pi over two to positive pi over two is half the period, but it's also one to one in this region, okay? It's not one to one in half of the period in this region. We know two pi is the full period of sine, but that's not one to one. Um, half of it is not one to one, but if you shift half of it over, then you do get a one to one section of it, okay? And so this is that one to one section graphed uh, again. Um, and so then we're always going to be talking about the domain for our sine function being negative uh, pi over two to pi over two, okay? And that's gonna be important because when we start to talk about the inverse, we need to remember that we're on this restricted domain here, okay? So for the first one that we're gonna get into, they say, um, so how is the inverse of y equal to sine of x denoted? Remember from the sentences before, you switch the x and y's to find an inverse. So if I switch the x and y, that equation would now read x equals sine of y. And then if you solve for y, it would mean that y would be alone and it would equal the sine inverse of x. Now be careful, this does not mean a negative one exponent. So it does not mean this, okay? That's not what it means. When you see sine with a negative one up here, it means inverse. It does not mean exponent of negative one. So be very, very, very careful there not to misread that, okay? I know that when you see this, you know that that's a square, which means it's an exponent, right? But when you see the negative one, it does not mean an exponent. It means the inverse, okay? And if we just look at our calculator very quickly, you'll see that we do have, excuse all my eraser bits all over my calculator, but we do have inverse trig functions on our calculators, okay? So we do have those, um, functions on there. And it, again, it's not a negative exponent. It is a trig, uh, inverse trig function, okay? So remember they said about uh, a function itself and its inverse being uh, reflections over the line y equals to x. Well, notice here, this is um, negative pi over two and negative one. This was the image for sine of x right here. Okay, so that one is the image for sine of x. And then if you switch the coordinates around and you switch those coordinates around, you get these points here. So then this is the image for sine inverse of x. It almost looks like a cubic function. It's not quite, but it almost kind of looks like a cubic function. It has that little curvature to it. Um, now, notice that this is reflecting across that line y equals to x, okay? So we're going to use that property um, here to solve the first example. So it says, example one, find the exact value of sine inverse um, of square root of 3 over 2. By definition, we know that y equals sine inverse of x, which means x equals sine of y, okay? Or if you use these variables and numbers given here, um, they're basically saying this is acting like the y and this is acting like the x. 
So when you switch it over into this form, the x is the square root of 3 over 2, and that will equal sine of the y, which is this guy over here, so sine of theta. It basically switches the sides, okay? So you can um, rewrite that just by converting over it by its definition, okay? Then what you're doing here is you're basically trying to figure out what angle gives me this sine value, right? And if you remember from the unit circle, these are the sine values for all of our basic unit circle um, entities. Now, I just memorize um, these things on the unit circle. I memorize one quadrant and then I use those values to find all the other quadrants. And I'll have to talk about that a lot in this class, um, just because it will keep popping up and keep popping up and keep popping up throughout the rest of the class. We'll have to keep reverting back to that unit circle. So just to quickly go over it, you have to remember that you have this value and this value and this value. Of course, we always know what happens on the axes. Those are relatively simple. Um, but this is pi over 6, this is pi over 4, and then this is pi over 3. And the coordinates to this point, pi over 6, is square root of 3 over 2 and 1 half. Coordinates here are square root of 2 over 2, square root of 2 over 2. Over here is 1 half and then square root of 3 over 2. So when we're talking about the sine, we're talking about the y values. So um, another thing that we need to know is that we're talking about, we have to consider the range of that sine function, that restricted sine function. Because if we're talking about an inverse, we have to be talking about that restricted domain, okay? And the restricted domain was negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, which means I also have these values down here. I'm trying my best to draw them properly. I know it looks a little bit messed up, but you get the idea. So this would be negative pi over 6. This would be negative pi over 4. This would be negative pi over 3. And then, of course, the coordinates here it would have the same x values. But the y values are now negative. So instead of positive 1 half, it would be negative 1 half, negative square root of 2 over 2, and then negative square root of 3 over 2. And so what we're looking for is the sine, the y value in this unit circle that will give us square root of 3 over 2, positive. And if I'm looking at my unit circle, here is where I have the y value. Nope, that's not it. It's the top one. Here is where I have the y value of square root of 3 over 2. So um, that means that the answer here, what is the angle? The angle is pi over 3. So that angle is pi over 3. And that's the value that we get here. Now, whether you're using a chart or you're using the actual unit circle image, or whether you've gotten really great and you've mastered how to create your own unit circle like I have. I mean, I've created half of it already. Um, this is really going to help you to do the problem. Now, you can do it in the calculator. And eventually, at some point, where I will be doing them in the calculator. But I want to show you how to get this answer in the calculator. Now, this is a radian, OK? So when I do the sine inverse, I'm going to type in um, square root of 3 over 2, and it should look exactly like it does on my paper. And when I do that, I'm in the wrong mode. I'm in degree mode. Pies are not degree mode. They're in radians. So let me go to radian mode real quick. And then I'm too lazy. I don't want to retype that, so I'm just going to hit Enter. And then now when I type it in, I get this. But this is not an exact answer. And as long as it is a multiple of pi, I will be able to figure that out by just dividing by pi. 
what that means is that this number times pi will equal the answer. What is that number as a fraction? That number as a fraction is this. And what is that number times pi? It's pi over three, okay? Now normally I don't do this part in the calculator. I just figure, I divide by pi. And then once I know what that fraction is, um, I just put the pi in the numerator. And one pi is the same as just pi. And so I get this thing over here, okay? So that's how you can find the exact answer in your calculator. So it is possible to do it without having to go to the uh, unit circle. But as an introduction, they usually use a unit circle so that you could figure out why it's pi over three, okay? And then you can trust your calculator after that, that it knows what it's doing and the answer is pi over three, okay? So um, let's see our exploration two. Um, it says answer sine inverse of three halves will be found, um, and these are approximate, so they will allow decimals. Decimals are allowed. It's when they want the exact answer that you have to be careful with that pi. So here it says this answer will be found in which quadrant only. Now we know that the range is from pi over negative pi over two to pi over two. So this is the range. So these this angle has to be somewhere in either quadrant one or quadrant two. Now, if you remember just a little bit about this, um, that means that sine of the angle will equal three over five. Remember, this is the y value and this is the r if it is not a unit circle, okay? So with that said, the y here, the r radius is always gonna be positive because it's a distance. But since the fraction itself is positive, it means that y is positive. And out of these two quadrants, the only quadrant where the y value is positive is up here. So that angle has to be in quadrant one. Now to use the calculator, I already have mine set in radian mode, so I'm gonna do sine inverse of three over five. And normally it asks you to round to the nearest hundredth. So I'm gonna, the three is not gonna change the four, so this is gonna be 0 0.64. Now let's try to look at the next one. The next one is um, sine inverse of negative two thirds. Again, you could think of this as sine of some angle equals negative two thirds. The radius is always positive, so that negative is gonna go to the y value. So the y value in this case is negative less than zero. Well, that's only gonna happen down here in quadrant two. So that's going to be the quadrant it's in. And then let me use my calculator to do sine inverse of negative two over three. Um, so then I get negative 0 0.73, because that nine will affect that two. Now, Notice that if you are using degree mode, that's perfectly okay, but you will have to manually convert your answer to radians, okay? Because when they ask you for these approximate values, they do want radians. I think there's a word problem in the assignment that might ask you for the degree. And so then in that case, in that one problem, you might um, use your calculator in degree mode just because they want the answer in degrees. But for all other cases, um, if it doesn't have like a box with a little degree here, then assume it's just asking you for radians. So if you just see a box without the degrees, that means radians and they want the answer in radians. So put your, your calculator in radian mode. Okay. So let's move on from there. It says, use the inverse functions to find exact values of composite functions. Combining what is known about composite functions with what is known about sine and its inverse. It can be said 
that the inverse of the original sign equals x as long as the x is in that domain of sine. And then sine of sine inverse equals x as long as x is between negative 1 and 1, which is the domain of the inverse. Remember, the range of the regular sign is the domain of the inverse. So essentially what you're going to look at is if sine is on the inside, then this value has to be between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. And that actually is. I mean, if you graph it, you're talking about an angle that's right here, a little small angle, pi over 12, okay? And that is between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2, which is essentially quadrant 1 and quadrant, I think I labeled it quadrant 2 in the last example, and it's actually quadrant 4, isn't it? It should be quadrant 1, quadrant 2, quadrant 3, and then quadrant 4. So this answer here is not quadrant two, be careful with that. It should be quadrant four. This is quadrant two and this is quadrant three. So be careful with that one. That was my mistake. I'm glad I caught it over here at least and didn't leave it wrong in the whole lecture. Okay. So now we have this quadrant one and quadrant four is the domain of sine. And this guy is in that domain. Because it's in that domain, these two things basically undo each other and you're gonna end up with pi over 12 as the answer. Now here, sine inverse is on the inside. So you have to make sure that this number is between negative one and positive one, and it is. Here's negative one, Here's positive one, here's zero, here's negative 0 0.4. So it is within that range or that interval. Therefore, these will undo each other and you end up with negative 0 0.4. Now here's where it might get a little interesting. Okay. Point three fifths or three pi over five we're talking about the sine, so it has to be between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. 3 pi over 5 minus pi over 2 is pi over 10. So if this would be pi um, over 2, I guess it would be okay. It might be still in there. Let's see. Dun, dun, dun. 3 pi over 2. Yeah. So it's about right here. This is 3 pi over. No, it would not. Get a common denominator. You're trying to compare 3 pi over 5 with pi over 2 because you can't go beyond this in the positive direction, okay? So, let's look about this. This one's gonna be tricky, very, very tricky. Now, in order for me to compare whether they're the same or not, or bigger or smaller, they have to have the same denominator. So I'm gonna multiply this one by five and five, and this one by two and two, and so I get six pi over 10, and here I get five pi over 10. Now this value is actually bigger than that value, which means that three pi over five is bigger than pi over two. So I'm outside, I'm bigger than pi over two. I'm outside of that interval. I'm over here, this angle is three pi over five, okay? So that's too big. That means I'm not going to have the same, um, that means I can't do this problem as is. However, if you notice, there's whatever that y value is, there is an angle that has the same y value on the other side that is within the negative pi to 2 pi um, domain. But what is this angle over here? How am I going to figure it out? What is that angle? What you're going to do is you're going to take um, 
Let's see, how will we figure that out? So whatever this distance is here, it's going to be that same distance over there. There's a bunch of different ways to do it. I just kind of do whatever comes natural to me. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take pi over 2 and I'm going to subtract 3 pi over 5. So I can figure out what this little distance is right there. Okay, so let's see. I get pi over 10 in my calculator. So I know that this is pi 10 and this is another pi 10. So if I want to go from here to here, I'm going to have to take 3 pi over 5 and subtract 2 pi over 10s, which means I'm going to get 3 pi over 5 minus 2 pi over 10. It means I'm going to get 13 pi over 10. And that's the angle right here. So this angle is 13 pi over 10. And so that would have the same y value. And now why am I looking at the y value? Because this is sine. So when these two things undo each other, we don't get 3 pi over 5. We get 13 pi over 10. Now what I want to see is I want to see if my calculator will give me that same answer. 3 pi over 5. Hmm. It is not giving me the same answer. So I'm trying to figure out, I don't want to erase that. Well, I can erase this. The calculator is actually giving me 2 pi over 5. And I'm wondering if I did my math here wrong. OK, I did figure out this is incorrect. Um, I did it in a calculator again. And when you do 3 pi over 5 minus 2 pi over 10, you don't get 13 pi over 10. I think I hit plus instead of um, minus. So you get 2 pi over 5, which means that this angle here is 2 pi over 5. So then this answer should be 2 pi over 5. Now, this explains why the answer is not 3 pi over 5. But as I mentioned before, once you understand why things are not what they may seem, um, you could start to trust your calculator when it gives you these values. So if I do the sine inverse of the sine of 3 pi over 5, and it wants the exact answer, I cannot type this in because it wants the exact answer. But if I divide that by pi, it means this times pi is the answer. So if I convert that, that's 2 fifths, which means 2 fifths times pi is the answer. And 2 fifths times pi can be written as 2 pi over 5. So the calculator does give you that answer. But there's a lot going on behind the scenes as to why that is the answer. And it is great to understand why before you just start using the calculator. Because then you'll realize if you type something in the calculator wrong, um, that's not going to be your answer. Okay. So now let's move on to cosine. So we've got the logistics of sine. We know how to use the calculator to get these values. We know where the values are coming from, why the calculator is giving us those particular values. Um, so everything is good with sine. But we do need to move on to cosine and then eventually move on to tangent, okay? So for cosine, here's the image again, a regular cosine periodic wave. Um, it's not one-to-one, -one, right? It does not pass the horizontal line test with my horrible straight line. Um, so it isn't one to one. Now I could take half of the period and go from zero to pi, 
And this time, if you notice, if you take the whole period, it's not one to one, right? That line's gonna cross twice. If I take half the period, zero to pi, notice this is one to one. If I try to take the same restriction on the cosine wave as I did on the sine wave, that would be from negative pi over two to pi over two. But if you notice, this interval is not one to one. It hits the horizontal line twice. So you have to take this portion of the, of the graph. So what that means is that the domain of, sine, of cosine, the restricted domain is going to be from zero to pi. And here they just regraph it the same. Now, I don't know if I mentioned this before, but if you're gonna use, um, I think they're gonna talk about it in the next section, but if you're gonna use the restricted um, domain for this, negative pi over two to pi over two, um, that's going to affect the cosecant as well, the sine and cosecant are co-functions, right? And then the same thing with the cosine, if that's the domain of the cosine, it's gonna affect the domain of the secant. Now, let's keep going. So we know what the restricted domain for cosine is, it's zero to pi. Um, and then again, the images, here's from zero to pi. And then if you swap these coordinates over, you get this point. If you swap these coordinates over, you get that point. If you swap over every coordinate in between here, you end up with all of these points. So this is the original cosine and then it's reflection over the line y equals x is this image here. And so that is the inverse cosine uh, function. So just like before, you can find the exact values by using the unit circle or by using a chart. Eventually, once you understand that, you'll be able to do the problems um, using triangles. You'll be able to do the problems using the calculator. And sometimes they may tell you to use a calculator. Sometimes they'll ask you for the exact answer and you might have to use triangles um, or unit circles. So, or circles in general, circles and triangles, right? Um, so that's gonna come into play, which is why we keep reverting to those unit circles um, to get these angles. negative square root of two over two. We already know by our unit circle, or if you know by using a chart, that the only time you're gonna get negative, remember cosine is the x value, right, in the unit circle. So I'm talking about from zero to pi, which means I'm up here, and I'm either in quadrant one or quadrant two this time, actually quadrant two this time. Um, and because it's a negative x value, it's going to be over here. And then that is negative square root of 2 over 2 and square root of 2 over 2. And this is pi over 4, 2 pi over 4. This angle here is 3 pi over 4. And so that's the angle that they're referencing there. Again, if you're using a chart, fantastic. If you're using the unit circle, which is what I prefer you to use, because later when they start talking about triangles, you're going to be clueless as to where this is coming from if you're not automatically reverting to the unit circle to figure these out by hand, okay? So, of course, we can use the calculator whenever we need to. Um, we just have to be careful. So, um, here it says for us to use the calculator. Remember, um, this is saying cosine inverse of 0 0.6. Uh, 0 0.6 should be within 0 to pi. This is in radians. Remember that pi is 3.14 something something, right? So this is between 0 and 3.14. So it is within that interval. So we should be able to find it, right? This interval here, okay? But this x value is positive, which means it's going to be over here somewhere. If the x value were negative, then the angle would be over there somewhere. So in this case, the answer is in quadrant one. And then if I do the calculator, I'm already in radian mode from the previous problems. Um, and if we round that to the 
hundredths place, we get 0 0.93. Um, and these are asking me for approximate values, so I am giving them decimals. Now here it says use a calculator in radium mode to find this value and explain your answer. Okay, so if I try to do cosine inverse of 1.8, I get error, domain error, right? Why? Why is that um, that cosine is going to be error or domain error? Um, dun, dun, dun. Cosine of 1.8 means I am going to be finding cosine of an angle that equals 1.8. But if you remember the graph of cosine, right? The highest y value that you're going to get is 1. It's never going to go above 1, ever, ever, ever. And because it's not going to ever go above 1, how is it ever going to equal 1.8? Correct? So that's what they mean by explain your answer. Why does the calculator tell us error? Um, it's because you cannot have a cosine value that is bigger than 1. So what do I answer in the computer here when it tells me to find cosine of negative, cosine inverse of 1.8? You're just going to say cosine inverse of 1.8 is undefined. Or I think I've also seen the phrase um, not defined. So cosine inverse of 1.8 is not defined. And so that's the answer you're going to pick. You're going to pick the answer that says it is not defined. Okay. So same thing as before. And this really does explain why what's happening up there for part C, right? Because you have the cosine inverse that has to be done first. And this is not going to be able to be done unless that x value is between negative 1 and 1. Okay. So this cannot be done unless the x value is between negative 1 and 1. So that really explains why what was happening in part C is what is happening, OK? The domain of cosine inverse is negative 1 to 1. So let's look at here. We've got cosine, and this has to be between 0 and pi. Remember, pi is the same as 3 pi over 3, and this is less than 3 pi over 3. So these will undo each other, giving you just pi over 3. Here, this is not in this domain. You have cosine here, but this is not in the domain at all. So we have to look at that and find a value that has the corresponding, um, so negative pi over 5 is down here. This is negative pi over 5. We need another point that is in this domain that has that same x coordinate. So we do have a reflection point over here, which is positive pi over 5, that does have the same x value. The only difference is, is that the y value will be negative. Okay? So in this case, it's actually going to end up being positive pi over 5. Now, again, you can use your calculator to justify cosine inverse, let's do the first one, cosine inverse of cosine of 2 pi over 3 um, divide by pi, and then convert that to a fraction. It is 2 pi over 3. And then um, for this one, we're going to do cosine inverse of cosine of negative pi over 5, close, close, hit enter, and then divide by pi, convert that to a fraction, and it is pi over 5. So we do get the same value. And why do these not just undo each other and I end up with the negative? It's because that value has to be in that domain, and this one wasn't. So we had to find one that corresponds to it that is, okay? Um, now here we've got cosine, cosine inverse is 0 0.6. Cosine inverse is on the inside. So I just need to make sure that 0 0.6 is between negative one and one, and it is. So these will undo each other, giving me with 0 
Here we have cosine inverse on the inside again, and then we get negative one to one. Now this is not an angle, so it can't work the same. Like when the cosine is on the inside, you can always take the cosine of anything. It's just, we know that when the inverse is involved, we have to talk about the restricted domain. But because we're talking about angles, we know that there's more than one way to express an angle that has the same sine or cosine or trig value. So this one we can manipulate and still get an answer. But when you have cosine inverse, this is not an angle, it's a value. And you can't manipulate that value, okay? So it's not the same as if the cosine were on the inside and you've got an angle you're manipulating. This one's completely different. And I've already tried to type that in my calculator and it just tells me error. And it's because this one is not defined. And why is it not defined? Because um, 1 1.8 is not in that interval negative one to one. It's just not, okay? It's outside of that interval. It's actually greater than one. So now we're gonna get into the tangent. So here's the original tangent graph. And if you notice, it's not one to one, right? You draw a horizontal line there. It's it's not one to one, it touches it on every single one of those little curves. But if you restrict it to one of those curves, negative pi over two to pi over two, then you do have a one to one portion of the graph. And so essentially, the sine and the tangent are going to have the same restricted domain, negative pi over two over two. The only one that has a different domain is going to be the cosine, and that one's from zero to pi. So we have to keep those straight in our mind as we keep going on through this chapter because it's gonna be very, very important, okay? So sine and tangent have a domain of negative pi over two to pi over two, and that's always going to be the domain that your calculator is going to know. And then your um, cosine is always gonna be from zero to pi. And so again, that's the domain that the calculator is going to know. So when it gives you its answers, it's going to give you the answers in that domain. Okay, now, um, just like before, the tangent, and, which is this one, this was the original tangent, and then the inverse tangent is just a reflection over the line y equals to x. Um, nothing big there. Let's go ahead and try to do this problem. Now, these are a little bit weird because I do use the unit circle, and I strongly suggest that you use the unit circle. I mean, you can have giant charts all over the place with the sine, cosines, and tangents if you wanted to. We've had three charts so far. We had one of these charts for sine, we had another one for cosine, and now we have another one for tangent. So if you wanna have all of those there on your paper, that is perfectly fine to have it in chart form. I don't like to memorize more things than I have to, so I literally only memorize the unit circle. Okay, once I have that unit circle, it's just a matter of me trying to manipulate everything so that it matches the unit circle. So I remember again those same three points, right? Pi over four, square root of two over two, square root of two over two. This is a square root of three over two and one half, and this is one half and square root of three over two. Remember, this is pi over three pi over four and pi over six, okay? Um, so what I do here is I manipulate this because normally with tangent, when you rewrite this, you write that tan of theta equals that, that value, negative th square root of three over three, okay? Now, um, I can do tan inverse to negative square root of three over three in my calculator. It will spit out negative pi over six. But why, right? Why does it spit out negative pi over six? That's the issue. Why? We know the domain of tan inverse is going to be in one of these two quadrants, negative pi over two to pi over two, okay? We know that already. So we have these same points over here right? The negative value. So negative pi over six, negative pi over four, and negative pi over three. And then with all these same coordinates, the only difference being is that the y values will now be negative. And so what I am looking for is I am looking for
when the tangent of my angle equals negative square root of three over three. If you remember what tangent is, tangent is the y value over the x value. I could put these y values on top of these x values and it will never look exactly like that, okay? So it really, really is going to require some master manipulation here, okay? And so one thing that I know, and I just know this from experience, okay, is that this is the same thing as this, just rationalized. If I unrationalize it, right? If you rationalize this denominator, you get that. If you rationalize this numerator, meaning I multiply by square root of three over square root of three, I get negative three over three square root of three, and then these reduce, giving me negative one over square root of three. So if I rationalize my numerator, I undo the rationalizing of the denominator. Another thing that I know is that this is the same thing as negative one half over square root of three halves. And again, if you were to use your fraction properties, um, these twos would end up canceling each other and then you would reduce down to that, okay? So essentially what I'm doing is I'm taking my numerator and multiplying it by a half and taking my denominator and multiplying it by a half, resulting in this, which is equivalent to the line before or the value before, okay? And this is what I will find on my chart. So where is the y value one half and the x value three squared to three over two? That happens here. But notice the y value is positive here. I need the y value to be negative. So I'm talking about this spot here where the square root of three over two is positive, but the one half is negative. And what is that angle right there? That angle is negative pi over six. So this is the why, why the answer is negative pi over six. But of course, if I type it in the calculator and I type tan inverse of negative square root of three over three, it gives me this. If I divide by pi and then convert it to a fraction, I get negative one six. So negative pi over six is the answer. And that's exactly what it was. If you're using the chart, it would be there, negative pi over six, okay? So this, I mean, you can use your calculator, but if I know I always have people who are curious as to, well, why is that the answer? Well, this is why, right? Using all the definitions and putting everything